Watch out for fool's gold. Hey, I am Chuck the Bureaucrat, and if you're fighting for resources in the shadowy corridors of the Pentagon, there's two colloquial phrases you're going to hear used a lot. That is the gold watch and gold plating. And while both of these sound the same, and they are part of the long oral tradition, they do not mean the same thing. In fact, I'm always a little amused when a Pentagon newcomer misuses one of these words. I mean, he's got the right attitude. He's just a little confused. But let's break both of these concepts down. First, gold plating is when someone submits a requirement to their higher headquarters that is wildly overpriced. It usually sounds something like this. Ladies and gentlemen, the Army faces an unprecedented crisis. Even as we speak, American soldiers' lives are at risk because we issue them these pens. I am here today to propose three courses of action. And number three, the obvious solution. These handcrafted gold-plated pens from an artesian manufacturer for $10 a piece. <laughs> these briefs are always the same. Status quo, too expensive and insanely expensive. And their recommendation is always to go with the insanely expensive one. That is gold plating. Now, usually they try to hide the outrageous expense in their cost estimates, but it usually pokes through because it's really expensive. Now, you might think that the reason for the gold-plated option is that they genuinely want to give their soldiers gold-plated artesian fountain pens. Usually not. I mean, even if they get the money, they typically turn around and spend it on something higher priority. So, in some cases, gold plating is just a technique to get a little extra cash for the commander's discretionary fund. But gold plating can also be a negotiating gambit. If you say you really, really want the money for the gold plated fountain pens, well, you can give it up in exchange for something else. Of course, gold plated requirements have very little effectiveness at a table full of bureaucrats. They all know how to gold plate. They know why you're gold plating, and they can tell when you're gold plating. So, on any normal day, gold plating is kind of a silly move. You'll just end up getting beat up. But there are some situations where you can get away with it. These are particularly at moments of uncertainty or crisis. There are occasionally instances where Congress wants to throw some money around, and in those cases, a gold plated plan can get pretty far. And I'm not being cynical about this. I have seen cases where a subordinate command submits a requirement and their higher headquarters goes back to them and says, can you put a little more gold plating on this? Sometimes these situations where you have a desperate gold plated Hail Mary requirement, they're just a situation where the higher command is going to siphon off funds that are intended for the lower command. Now, don't tell anyone that I told you this, but there is a better way to present your gold-plated plan. You propose four courses of action. Status quo, a little more expensive, kind of expensive, and insanely expensive. Then you recommend course of action number three, kind of expensive. And this is more than just negotiating fundamentals like anchoring and increments. See, what you do is you map out the knee in the curve where increases of money stop producing increases in the outcome. I don't know, kind of most bang for your buck thinking. Anyways, that is gold plating, your overinflated requirement, which is entirely different than the gold watch technique. The gold watch technique has to do with proposing reduction, cuts in funding. This story comes from Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense back in the 1960s. He had been the president of Ford Motor Company, and while he was there, corporate would set targeted cuts to department's operating funds, pretty much routine business behavior. One year, in order to meet the reduction quotas, a department head recommended eliminating the gold watch that employees got when they retired. That caused a huge uproar among the rank and file, and they went to McNamara to complain. McNamara calls the department head in and is like, 
what gives. The department head basically says, look, if you make me cut my operating costs, I'm just going to pass that on to the workforce. In effect, the department head was saying, I'm not going to find operating efficiencies. I'm just going to stir up trouble for you. That is the gold watch technique. In order to build an alliance against the proposed cuts, you injure a vocal minority so that they go argue against the cuts for you. This technique works pretty well against novice bureaucrats, especially the ones who are still under the illusion that they can distribute resources in a way that makes everybody happy. Some rising colonel fresh out of brigade command where everybody loved him. Well, he gets surprised by this gambit. Sometimes they just shift the cuts to somebody else and set off a whole new series of screaming. Once they get a little more seasoned and recognize the gold watch technique, they get better at reflecting the bad vibes back at the person who started this. So I would avoid using the gold watch technique against anyone but the most inexperienced bureaucrat. And even then, his staff is going to notice, so work fast. There's one variation on this technique that I don't think is technically a gold watch, but a lot of people lump them together. This variation is so ballsy, so blatantly insubordinate that I am stunned every single time I see it. It usually plays out between a three or four star general and a service secretary or, or some other political appointee. The way it works is a new administration comes in and they set new priorities for simplicity and so I don't implicate anyone. Let's say vehicle modernization is the new number one and there is no other number one. And then a cut comes down and then some ballsy three star does this. Mr. Secretary, we followed your guidance to find $200 million worth in cost savings. We cut $170 million from vehicle modernization and distributed the remaining $30 million across all other programs. In effect, what they're saying is, Mr. Secretary, we completely ignored your guidance. See how that's slightly different than the gold watch? And the idea here is that the secretary cares so much about vehicle modernization that they're going to reverse the cut because that's the thing that the general cut. I don't think there's a second lieutenant in the army who would be stupid enough to pull this stunt, but you'd be amazed how many general officers do it. What's really weird about this public display of disobedience is that it does not get punished the way you think it would. Some company commander tries this and his battalion commander is going to nuke him on the spot. But like my old first sergeant said, different spanks for different ranks. I can't prove it or even provide any evidence to support my claim. But what I think happens is that these churlish general officers get a little mark beside their name. Something that means put this SOB in charge of the next political shitstorm catastrophe. And strange as it seems to me, these dudes seem to like that kind of a job. So I guess it all works out. And so those are some of the ways that organizations respond to cuts. The gold plating of overinflating requirements and the gold watch technique of cutting a beloved program. And now, if you want to see how higher headquarters lays in these cuts and the logic behind salami slices, watch this video.